Good evening. We have two different clocks here, and I got my pick, so I picked that one. So we are starting the forums now, and so happy to see see all of you here. We w I welcome you on behalf of Clallam County League of Women Voters, um, and on behalf of the league and the community, I wish to thank the city for allowing us to use the transit center. That's a real plus for us and it's a nice facility. I am Bertha Cooper. I am a member of the league and I'll be moderating this evening's forum uh, with candidates for an Olympic Medical Center Commission position and the Charter Review Commission. I am joined tonight by our timers, who are Kathy Claney, Pen. <laughs> we want to be sure, candidate seat timers. And Sharon McGuire. And they're the ones who are going to be alerting to the speakers to stay within their time limits. And they do that gently unless you don't pay attention. <laughs> our mic holder is Carol Hull. So when we have audience questions, she will be standing here for you or at the side for you to come up and um, uh, ask your questions. Her job is to hold the mic and not give it to you. So she does not do that kindly if you try to get it. We're also pleased tonight to have video <laughs> videographer Tim Bry, Tim, he's obviously the one recording this event. We'll have a link uh, posted on the league's website within the next few days, and we have our website listed on this banner, do we not? So that if you find this forum useful, and those people who chose not to come tonight, you might tell them to go on the league website and learn about these candidates and learn about the Charter Commission. So, so please pass the word. Uh, a reminder as always, please turn off your cell phones and other devices that make noise or visually distract others. Also, reminder, that the league does not allow independent recording of part or all of the forum without permission. So please don't silently record. We'll watch. The restroom, probably many of you have been in this room, but the, rest, the restrooms are in the front of the lobby. Uh, obviously, if you want to get a drink of water or if you need to leave, you're certainly welcome to do that. The League of Women Voters is an organization whose purpose is to promote the informed and active participation of citizens in government. Our goal for tonight's forum is to provide Clallam County citizens with the information to help them be informed and knowledgeable voters. You can find more information about the League on the membership table near the door or by going on the website. The uh, best part is you can join even if you're a man. So think about it. I want to introduce our program tonight. Our first panel will consist of candidates for Olympic Medical Center Commissioner District 1, Position 1. We'll run this panel in our customary manner, starting with three-minute opening statements by the candidates in the order they file for the office followed by questions from you, the audience, and then wrapping up with a one-minute closing, uh, closing in reverse filing order. Our second forum will be handled a little differently due to the number of positions and number of candidates for the Charter Review Commission. Clallam County is one of seven counties in Washington that have home rule charter. What does that mean? A home rule charter allows counties to adopt 
a constitution that can change their form of government and or create requirements for the operation of the government beyond those required by the state constitution. The Clallam County Charter Review Commission is convened every five <coughs> years. The Charter Review District aligns with the county commissioner districts. Voters from each district vote for five candidates to fill five positions. The top five vote getters for each district together make up the commission of 15 members, which serve a one year term. Although candidates for the Charter Review Commission will only appear on the November 5th general election ballot, not the primary ballot in August, the League has opted to hold these forums now. We felt we could give more attention to the Charter Review Commissioner and voters more time to become familiar with the Commission and the candidates by holding the forum early. <coughs> the general election season will be a very busy one and other local races will be competing for yours and ours attention. The Charter Commission happens only every five years, and we all need to reacquaint ourselves with its role and the importance to the community. The, uh, because we are doing a little different format, you were I think everybody was handed this evaluation form at the conclusion, not you? No. <laughs> she didn't get one, not everybody got one. <laughs> well, we have. Yeah, okay, you want to ha you raise your hand if you didn't get one, because we really do want to have your input. Uh, this is an, we're doing something a little different, and we want to know if you think <coughs> it's a good idea. Okay? So I will be reminding of you that. Yeah, there's some over here as well, Carol. When we start that part of our forum, which will be in about an hour, uh, we'll start with Kim Ortloff, who's a Clallam County Deputy Prosecuting Attorney in the Civil Division. And she will tell you about the Charter Review Commission, why it exists, and what its mission is. We'll allow a few questions for her, so to help to make sure we really understand what we, can, what we should expect for the candidates for the commission. We'll then have each candidate uh, our, 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 their representative make an opening statement of no more than three minutes. We have 10 candidates represented tonight for this commission. So you can see that we have that just opening statement. So you want to be as, uh, as uh, pay as much attention as possible. But after you've heard them, we are going to give you an opportunity, which we are referring to as candidate speed dating. <laughs> we are going to ask the charter candidates to spread out in the room and place themselves so that you can go and ask them questions and listen to the other questions that they're getting. There's not a lot of time for it, but it's an opportunity for you to meet and to shake hands and to get to know them and ask a particular question. When we concluded the speed dating part, the candidates mm -hmm. will come back up to up here and we'll, uh, we'll conclude with each candidate giving a one minute closing statement. So that's the evening. <laughs> Should be fun, huh? Speed candidate dating. <clears throat> All right. Uh, did everybody get an agenda? Well, I already asked that. We don't want you all to have one. <laughs> we have spare agendas. Oh, oh, everybody gave up a lot of agenda. Okay, that's good. All right. Well, we're going to start with Olympic Medical Center. We are here to learn from and about the candidates for the hospital commission who will appear on the August 6th primary ballot. All three, of their, all three of them, their names, will appear on the August 6th primary ballot, and I'm sure they all hope to advance to the general election. It's the League of Women Voters practice to hold for, forums only for primary races where there are three or more candidates. 
the SQUIM OMC commissioner position is the only OMC race that has more than two candidates. Two other OMC commissioner races are being held, but in one case there are two candidates, and in the other case there is a single candidate. The three candidates who file for a nonpartisan District 1, Position 1 in the order they filed are Warren Pierce, Nate Atkinson, and Anna Marie Henninger. Under Washington's top two primary system, the top two vote getters in this race will advance automatically to the general election on November 5th. Now a little bit about a public hospital district. Olympic Medical Center is a hot public hospital district that was formed in 1951. At the time and to this day, state law allows communities to decide whether to form a hospital district and levy taxes within the district to support the hospital and related services. OMC is Clallam County Hospital District number two and essentially covers the two Eastern County Commission districts. The rest of Clallam County is hospital district number one. Hospital districts are governed by a board of commissioners elected by the voters of the hospital district. OMC has a seven member board. Three geographical areas are defined within the hospital district and each has two board member positions that must be held by a person residing in the area. So all these candidates live in SQUIM. The seventh member is an at-large position. So, in order they file, I'm going to ask them just in a minute uh, to uh, make their opening statement of no more than three minutes. Then following those remarks, it's your turn to ask questions. So be th as they talk, be thinking about the questions you have. What is of interest to you? You may pose questions for one or more candidates. We do ask you to give your name and residence when you come to the mic. You have 30 seconds to ask your question. So keep that in mind when you're writing out or thinking about your question, be ready. You may address your question to a particular candidate, but all candidates will be given the opportunity to answer the question. We also have league index cards, do we? Uh, so if you prefer not to come to the mic, you can uh, fill out a card and put your question on a card and our volunteers will read it for you. Is there anybody who would like a card, a pencil to write a question down or think about, or make notes, you know? Or just... Okay. And, and and the league members passing this out, Bonnie is one and Margie is one. As you write your questions uh, and you have them during the uh, audience participation, just, just hand it to them and they will read it for you. All right. And you have 30 minutes to ask it. The candidates have 30 seconds. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Oh. <laughs> 30 seconds, and, and the candidates have one minute to answer it. And then, when we're all done with that, the candidates will have an opportunity for a one minute closing uh, remarks. All right, we have asked the candidates to introduce themselves by covering the following information in their three minute opening statement. What should voters know about you as a candidate for Olympic Medical Center Commissioner? And what are the major challenges facing Olympic Medical Center and how do you intend to address them? Uh, candidates, keep your eye on the timer so you can gauge your time. They will, let, they will give you warnings. So we're going to start with the person first filing and that's Warren. Pierce. Warren. When do, we, when do we start? Okay. Hi, I'm Warren Pierce and I'm from Chicago, Illinois. 
I'm married. My wife Nancy and I have been together for 51 years. I have two daughters, one granddaughter, and I better tell, I have two grand dogs. <laughs> I retired at the end of 2013, and Nancy and I moved here in 2014. My business career spans over 40 years. The last 25, I was Senior Vice President of Information Technology. My major responsibilities included leadership, multiple strategic planning, financial, operational, and capital budgets up to $25 million. I created uh, and, and was the project head for designing multiple warehouse distribution centers and data centers around the world. Currently, I'm on Olympic Peninsula YMCA board. I'm on the SWIM YMCA board. I'm the volunteer accountant for the Clallam County Park and Rec District Number 1, which used to be called SARC. And I'm the president of the Newcomers Club here on the Olympic Peninsula. I consider my best skills to be that I'm a good listener, very good listener, a communicator, and I have good interpersonal skills to work with other people. Most of you probably know, but just in case you don't, the commissioner's main role is to oversee the management of OMC's business and community operations. The day-to-day -day operational responsibility is up to an OMC administrator. They've done an excellent job, as the accolades and awards will attest to. When told about uh, the league wanting to know what uh, would be a major challenge, for me, I've been involved with the hospital and involved <laughs> Okay, thank you. I've been involved with the challenge of the reimbursement cuts for Medicare. And many of you may know that the Port Angeles medical facility doesn't get reimbursement cuts like the facilities in SQUIM. So the reality is 83% right now of the patients for OMC are Medicare patients. And ultimately, if the legislative agenda that's being pushed now and the other agendas are not completed, what the hospital will be forced to do is have the SQUIM facility patients go to the Port Angeles facility because the SQUIM patients get cut. They're only cutting 30% this year, but 60% next year. So at this point in time, that's something that I would, would work towards, but unfortunately, that <coughs> seems to be uh, the only solution that probably is going to come to fruition. Thank you. Snap. Um, first, I'd like to thank the, the League of Women Voters for putting this on. And I know these things um, require a lot of time and effort, and they're always so well run. So thank you um, for, for putting this on. Um, my name is Nathan Adkisson. I've been in SQUIM since 2006. I live here with my wife and two kids, eight and nine. And I love this community, and, and I love it here. Um, I grew up in, in Bremerton. The only time I would come out to the peninsula was to play sports and, and camp. And so ending up here was a choice of my wife, and she forced me to move out here. And so here we are, and, I, and it's one of the best communities and best places I can think of to possibly live. Um, I'm running for this position first and foremost because I, I love this community and I care deeply about the healthcare system, in part because I've experienced and used it um, substantially over the last um, 10 years and with multiple um, healthcare providers, uh, healthcare um, insurance, and, and having to navigate the system has become a passion of mine. And so, being in the financial industry in this community, um, doing mortgages for people moving here, I, I, get the, um, I get to see people's credit histories. And I'm very um, passionate about OMC's uh, collections, judgments, and wage garnishments of patients that, although we see collections regularly, I've had experience with, with actual patients who have been, had their wages garnished. And I will advocate to um, make that policy more friendly. Um, currently, in the instances that I've experienced with people that I know, 
it's disrupted their lives after tra traumatic events. Mm -hmm. And so I, as a, everyone knows the cost of healthcare is extensive and expensive, and it's become a major issue with us and everyone who uses it. So I, I look to advocate policies that will make payment and collections more friendly. Um, obviously, with the, the coming cuts, the CMS changes, the continued threats of cuts to Medicare reimbursements, our demographics in this community are against us. And so those are going to be the biggest challenges we face. And I would offer that we look to other outside funding sources um, and potentially creating an insurance system that would be local, that would provide prim primary care or emergency care as a supplemental option, um, like life, the Life Flight system. Obviously, it cost more and be an affordable monthly payment that could potentially create revenue um, to the OMC district and, and a hospital. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, Anne Marie. Oh, and I'd like to also thank the League of Women Voters and all of you for coming out tonight. I know it was a little drippy, so. Uh, I was born and raised in Seattle, and after I completed high school there, I went to Tacoma to the University of Puget Sound. That's where I got my bachelor's degree in psychology. After that, I headed to Missouri, something that my husband often calls misery, because that's where he was in basic training. <coughs> and I got my nursing degree at St. Louis University. I came back to Seattle and began working as a neonatal ICU nurse at Seattle Children's Hospital. I married my husband, Ray, who is a physical therapist, and we uh, started our family. <coughs> Five years later, we decided it was time to get out of the big city, and we decided that SQUIM was our destination. So we moved over here, and for the last 23 years this month, we have been living and working and playing and homeschooling and volunteering right alongside our seven children. So I am running for the Board of Commissioners because I am passionate about the health and well-being of this community, and I see service on the board as, as a way to help people achieve that. As you know, I'm a registered nurse, so right now I am one of the nurse managers for the Dungeness Valley Health and Wellness Clinic. I work for a local medical office. I am a summer camp nurse one week every summer. I have a private practice, if you will, as a childbirth doula and lactation specialist. And I also provide um, on-site visits for a local daycare as a nurse consultant. I have been attending the Board of Commissioner meetings for almost two years. I've also had the opportunity to interview all but one of the current commissioners to pick their brains. And this week I also met with the chief financial officer to speak with him and get his input. I've also spent a lot of time studying the Commissioner Handbook and the relevant RCWs, as well as being online and reading about rural health care. So the top three issues in my mind are reimbursement for services, workforce recruitment and retention, along with provider access, and advocacy at the local, state, and federal level. How am I going to address those issues as a member of the team? I don't come in with an agenda other than to serve and work together with the other commissioners to achieve the goals that are listed in the strategic plan, which is an amazing document. So I'm going to offer compassion and persistence and diligence. Someone once told me I was relentless, and they didn't mean it as a compliment, but I take it as one. And I am dedicated to protecting and guiding and advocating this hospital district. Thanks. Thank you, candidates. Next, we will take as many questions as possible from you. Once again, all candidates will have an opportunity to respond to all questions, even those directed to a specific candidate. Candidate responses will be limited to one minute per person. Uh, where is, there she is. Okay. There is our mic holder, Carol, who, so I'm going to ask you to, do you mind? To that. <laughs> um, I'll ask uh, you to start lining up now with your questions or passing your questions to either Bonnie or yeah, Margie or to, me, this one. Or to you uh, to be read, to be asked. So if you start, 
And while you're all lining up excitedly, <laughs> I'm going to, I'll, I will ask a question, a general question. Despite OMC's and the community's best efforts, OMC received, as mentioned, all three of you, has mentioned a considerable cut in reimbursement that would impact services in SQUIM by relocating them to Port Angeles. As a board member, what do you think the primary consideration should be in relocating services? Would they all be relocated? What would it mean to SQUIM? All right, I'm gonna start with Nate. <laughs> Um, it basically, I mean, it, in relocating the services to Port Ant, I mean, you're obviously going to be looking at, at what the, the cost implications are, who you're going to, who you need to keep in SQUIM, the most important services that are, that are in SQUIM to people who can't get to Port Angeles, um, those are going to be the top considerations in which um, services you do move there and, and try to, to make up um, the, for the losses to keep as much there as possible. Um, and obviously that's going to work in with the, the, own, the board and, and um, the, the administration to, to figure out what those best, best solutions are to ensure that we keep as much of the service here as we possibly can based on what individual cuts are going to be used. Anne Marie? I think it's a little bit early to be talking about losing services in SQUIM. Right now, the board is committed to maintaining services just as they are, with an eye toward what might be coming down the, the road. And so um, our, we have a representative in Representative Kilmer who has just um, petitioned or put forth the PLACE Act, which would halt the CMS cuts. So that's one venue that's being pursued. The hospital is also involved in a lawsuit to stop those CMS cuts. So I think we need to be thinking ahead long term, but continuing on the path we're on to keep the services available in SQUIM and Port Angeles as they are right now. Warren. Well, what I would say is, is it's obvious that we want to keep all the services we can in SQUIM. And uh, Anne Marie is correct. There are legislative efforts, there's court efforts, but the reality is the legislative effort from Kilmer is going to a committee, several committees, and it probably will not pass the Senate. Um, I just, unfortunately, the, the answer is not a good one. And that is from a financial standpoint, I think the hospital would do whatever they can to financially maintain their 2% margin. Uh, which is barely enough to keep the hospital operating, you know. And so at some point, SWIM patients will have to be, you know, go to the other facility. And I don't know how that will happen, but it, it will at some point if we don't get the legislative or judicial work done. And the court system is, is very slow. That's not one that anybody is hoping will come through very quickly. So, and, and one last thing, the 2020 cuts, they said are double what the 2019 cuts are. Thank you. All right, uh, questioners, remember to say your name and where you live and, uh, and who you want to address oh, your <laughs> question to and no, don't grab the mic. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sheena Younger. I live at 253 Dungeness Meadows. And first, I want to thank you for running for election. It's a very brave thing to do. My question is pretty simple. I think that having historical data and having a good solid understanding of how the board functions currently is really important. And so I'd like to hear from each of you. In the past 12 months, there's been 24 board meetings, two per month. How many have you attended? And we'll start with Anne-Marie. I have attended all but four of the meetings over the last two years. Nate? Zero. I'm sorry, I should have gone to Warren. Warren. I've attended zero, but I do read the minutes for each one. Uh, there's both a working session meeting and then a general meeting, and I read the minutes religiously. They're posted online at the website. I apologize, Warren. You said zero. All right, okay. All right, next question. I wish I could ask more than one question. <laughs> uh, my name is Marsha Lamoche, and I live here in Squim. Um, 
Given this challenge with the Medicare reimbursement issue and reflecting a little bit on the fact that under the Affordable Care Act and the great expansion of Medicaid, we have many more insured people here in SWIM, which has brought us more primary care providers and improved access for everybody. But given that we have this more than 80% who are Medicare here, how do you foresee or what is your concept for universal health care, Medicare for all, whatever you want to call it? And we will start this with Warren. Well, I'm certainly for it, but one of the realities is our tax base in this country is a lot lower than it used to be because so many jobs, especially in the manufacturing section, are gone. So one of the problems is just the tax revenue. But I'm certainly for it. Anything that will help insure everybody and give them quality health, you know, health care is, is spectacular. But all these proposals, to me, they're just, there's no tax money. If there was, that would be great. Me. I'm, I'm for universal coverage. I don't think there's a better option when you look at the, the macro numbers of, of health of countries that have universal care. Um, you can always point to individual um, anecdotal situations, but when you look at all of the macro data, having universal health care is the best way to provide it. And I'm going to agree with my fellow candidates in favor of health care coverage for everyone. I think that there are pros and cons to universal coverage. Some of the pros would be that obviously everyone is covered and we have a healthier population. We're spending less on health care. <coughs> it can be considered to be better for business because we don't have to be spending as much on insurance. Um, if you, like the hospital, they're paying for insurance for all of their employees. Well, if it was universal care, there wouldn't be that expense to the degree that it is. If, if we were to do that, the cons would be there would be tax hikes, there's going to be reduced government funding, there's not going to be competition anymore in that particular market. So I would support it. It seems like it's a gargantuan task. Thank you. All right, next question. My name is Nancy Field. I live on Woodcock, just north of Swim. Um, my question is, in light of uh, Washington state law that requires every hospital district that provides maternity care to also provide the full range of women's reproductive health care, including abortion, <coughs> where do you stand on the potential and the requirement that Olympic Medical Center should also be providing abortion uh, services very limited in availability right now in Tallinn County? Nate? I, I believe in choice. And I, I, I believe it should be accessible and, and available to provide the best care for, for women. And I think it's um, very important that OMC does provide that care. I don't consider abortion to be health care. Well, I am pro-choice, but I would tend to have to look at the um, issues more revolving well, why the hospital would be the abortion center or the area where abortions would be done. I don't know if that typically is done at hospitals across the United States. I'm just not familiar with it. You know, hospital care and uh, the hospital situation is not my area of expertise. Uh, so I, I just I couldn't answer, but I definitely am pro-choice. <coughs> All right, next question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My name is Sarah Johnson. I've lived here in the uh, Squim area uh, since 2001 when I moved here to join my uh, youngest daughter and her family before all her, my grandchildren grew up. <clears throat> and I'm a nurse, a retired nurse, public health from Detroit. And I've lived with uh, uh, access to care and decided before I moved here to make sure there was a good hospital here. So I, my husband just died this month or uh, in June. We need your question. And the question is, 
can we do a better job of making carrying out the law that got 70 percent of the vote that allows a person to choose death with dignity it's the law but it's impossible to implement it here warren well i wish to give you my sympathies i'm sorry that happened I really am not familiar with that law, and I wouldn't know how to answer that question one way or another. I just know that if it was myself in that position, I certainly would like to go out on the same the terms that I want to go out on. Me? I. I think when it when it comes to providing that and following the law of that, it's. That's something I, I believe is up to the healthcare providers and the doctors and those people who carry that out. I, I don't, um, I, I would support anybody's choice to make that decision, but I, I don't have a, a, an idea or a policy that could make that happen here on the peninsula that would help that. I think that's entirely up to the to OMC and their doctors and their, and their folks to make those decisions. Anne-Marie. So as a volunteer for Clallam County, or volunteer hospice in Clallam County, and also being familiar with Assured Hospice, I know that within those two organizations, it is possible to choose this option, um, particularly with Assured Hospice. Uh, volunteer Hospice of Clallam County will provide information about it, but when it comes time for a patient to make that choice, they simply step back um, for the time of death, and then they come right back in to assist the family. So I'm, I'm sorry for the loss of your husband, and I'm sorry that that was an issue or in your experience. I do know that it is available and people are availing themselves of that option here in Clown County. Next questioner. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Ian Nickel. I live on uh, 5th and Laurel in Port Angeles. And uh, my question is in regards to uh, climate change. And so uh, climate change affects every aspect of our life, uh, and it will only exacerbate the issues that we're currently facing right now. So in regards to public health, um, if elected as an OMC commissioner, how do you plan on addressing the climate crisis um, and, uh, and its uh, public health issues? Nate. I believe that climate change is a major issue. Um, how that's addressed from from this board, uh, I honestly I don't know, um, but it's it's clear from our own um, geographic area, the acidification of the ocean, all of the stuff that's going on here, where you can identify and point to these changes, um, they're definitely happen happening, and and it's going to be something that's going to be a continual. Um, evaluation of boards like this and and a bunch of other agencies and government entities um, so those those issues are going to have to be addressed and and what those look like or are going to be i i don't have an answer for that and marie so i think on a on a big or global scale this hospital district doesn't have a lot of sway or power if you will but within the hospital district and its facilities absolutely things can happen i we can be using fewer supplies or watching how they're packaged we can be monitoring what's being emitted into the air um, with different anesthetic gases for example and i think that that is something the hospital is aware of and could do better work in so as regards our clinics in SQUIM and our hospital in Port Angeles, those are the areas that the board would have some ability to effect change. Warren. Well, I think what's important to realize is that the board has an opportunity at these meetings to make suggestions to the administrator who runs the facility. And, um, you know, from my perspective, just hearing you talk about that, it's something that I think I've not seen discussed in, in the meetings at all. And maybe it just needs to be someone, whether it's one of us three, that has to bring that up and see how the other commissioners feel about that. So that's, that's how I would address that issue is I think it is a critical issue. And it's just a question of someone bringing that forward. Thank you. Hi, I'm Connor Dowling, and I'm here from the Squim Gazette, and I have a question on um, opioid and drug problems in Clown County. Uh, what do you see the Commission's role in helping um, improve both knowledge, treatment, and um, the general issue of drug use in the area? Anne-Marie. 
You have identified it as a crisis, and it is indeed a crisis. And I think that as the board, the, bo the role of the board is governance. And so in that role, it's our job, or the job of the commissioner, to be listening to what's brought up at those meetings from the public health department, from the emergency department, from area providers who are treating these folks, and then make some decisions about how much money is gonna go to treatment and assistance within that framework at the hospital district level. We have some amazing programs in place already, which is great, but we can be doing more. One. Well, from my perspective, I think it's all about education, but I will say, I think one of the problems is it is so inexpensive to obtain these opioids. And my wife just had surgery yesterday and she got 25 hydrocodines for $1.50. So it's just ridiculous if they made these things a little more expensive, maybe they wouldn't just be handed out like candy. But I, I think it's just an educational standpoint to do the best you can to educate people on what is going to happen to their body as they continue to use these. So that's that's what I would advocate. Nate. As, as a board member, I'm going to listen to the experts in the field, the, the people that are actually carrying out the work on, on where resources and money should be spent. Um, I, I have no expertise in, in what the best, most effective treatments are. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges, though, in that crisis is, is NIMBY behavior. We don't want those facilities in our backyard. And so finding a place to put and, and, and handle those types of services is probably the biggest challenge that the board will, will face and have, have a position on and in influencing. Um, but ultimately, the care, the, the whatever, the, the things that need to be done, I, I defer that to the experts. Thank you. Sorry. All right, next question. Um, my name is Judith Parker. I live in Sherwood Village and Squim. <clears throat> and this question is a follow-up question to Anne-Marie. So I understand that uh, you don't believe abortion is part of health care, but do you acknowledge the law? And do you acknowledge that others may have a different um, opinion and actually deserve legal access under Washington law? Thank you. So I. I'm aware of the law, and I think it is possible to, for people to get what they want within that framework. Uh, I do agree with the current status of the hospital that it would not be providing abortion services. Jefferson General does. And I think I lost the rest of your question. Can you repeat the last bit? Well, I, I was wondering if you acknowledge the, that yes, other people thank you. do. I, I absolutely acknowledge that that is a choice that people want to have, want to be able to make and want to have access to accomplish, if that makes sense. Warren, would you like to respond to that? Sure. Well, I think we discussed before, uh, at least I said, I am pro-choice, and I just don't know or really understand if the hospital is the place to be doing the abortion. It might be the safest place, um, but I, I just don't know the answer to that. And I don't know across the country in areas where abortions are welcomed if hospitals are doing them. I know Anne Marie just mentioned you know, a hospital that did it, but for me it would just be a question of whether that makes any sense for OMC to do. Nate, do you wish to add to your answer? I don't have any. Okay. All right. Do we have another question? Well, I have a question here. Is there any other written questions that someone is, would like me to read? The Squim area is the fastest growing area of the county. We badly need our own hospital. What is your position on this issue? This is from Ted Miller from Squim. Warren. Well, I think the hospitals, uh, according to law, you can only have a hospital within so many miles of the other hospital. I don't know the exact RCW of law, but I think that's part of the problem. Otherwise, OMC would probably try to do something in SQUIM to make a hospital, but they can't because it's too close to where the other hospital is. So that would be my answer at this point, is that the law is the problem as far as having a hospital, at least around this area right here. It would be great to have a hospital in SQUIM. I, I don't think it's feasible given um, the, the changes that are likely to come in reimbursements, um, being that it, the demographics here are even higher percentage um, of 
of the age that would be public reimbursements. I, I, I don't think it's um, a feasible thing that's going to happen uh, and that, that's going to be able to even be considered um, in the coming few years. Um, something down the road if things change. Um, but at this point, not knowing what's coming at hospitals and reimbursements, that preserving the services that we have may be the main thing that the board and OMC spends the next few years doing. So I think I'm going to have to agree with Warren as far as what he says regarding the RCW 70.44. That's where you're going to find everything related to public health districts. As a commissioner, though, I am tasked with being a good steward of the resources that are available to me. And as much as I would love to have a hospital and swim, especially as a nurse, from a financial standpoint, it's not good stewardship at this point in time. Perhaps if the CMS cuts had not been voted into reality, then we could go that direction. But there's not a possibility of doing that at this point in time. Uh, let me ask a follow-up question to that. I think it was about a year ago that both our local fire district three and the city of Squim Council uh, didn't. They didn't propose a hospital, but they proposed an emergency facility where they could take patients rather than transporting them to uh, Port Angeles and. Uh, the, the reasoning was that it would save time for everyone and possibly lives due to delay and could go in the other direction if they needed to go to a, uh, a larger hospital. So if I could, uh, with that question, if uh, Nate, do you have a response for that? My concern with that would be if it stretched resources in, in Port Angeles <laughs> to the point to where you're potentially not providing um, equal care at both places. Obviously, if it's something that can be funded and 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 be put into place, I would I would I would support that. Anne Marie. So, what we would run up against in that circumstance is the CMS cuts again. We would be more than 250 yards away from the main hospital building, and so we would not be getting the adequate reimbursement from Medicaid and Medicare. One thing that is on the horizon, which I'm excited about, is both the walk-in clinic in Squim and the walk-in clinic in Port Angeles are expanding their hours, hopefully up to 11 p.m. at night, which will not necessarily be emergent care, but it is gonna be another <coughs> opportunity for people to get taken care of so they don't flood the ER. Warren. Well, I would say as far as the emergency uh, care here, if it was in the financial interests of the hospital, but with the cuts that they've got already. I mean, we need quality care here, but we can't ignore the fact that this is a publicly funded hospital, and the, if they can't absorb that type of uh, cuts here, it just wouldn't make any sense. So I'd be for it if it made sense economically. If it didn't, we shouldn't fool ourselves. We'd just be paying more in taxes at some point down the road to the hospital district. All right, I'm going to have to call time because we're going to be ready for, get ready for the Charter Commission review, um, and we, we want to get closing statements. But to those of you who have more questions, we're hoping that you will hang out after our, our, our other forum and that will be available to answer some questions. So we hope that can happen. So let's do closing statements, and we will start in reverse order of filing, and that would be Anne Marie. Thank you. So as a candidate for commissioner, I am committed to the OMC values of quality and safety and teamwork and respect and compassion and integrity and stewardship, as I already mentioned. I study diligently, I act responsibly, I listen respectfully, and I bring healthcare experience, commitment, and passion to the position. I also have a skill set that I judge meshes beautifully with the role of commissioner. The benefits to electing me are that I have been coming to these meetings for two years. I have a strong knowledge base already. So even though becoming a commissioner is a very steep learning curve, I'd like to think mine would be somewhat less steep. I also am offering a woman's perspective and diversity on the board. We only have one woman commissioner right now. 
I'm a healthcare provider, I'm a healthcare consumer, and a big thing for me is that I'm going to be compatible with the board that is already there. Thank you. Nate. My main reason for running for, for the board has to do with my own personal experience with the cost of, of the medical care. It's reached such a point that it's, it's a part of care. People make decisions not to go get care. People are, are negatively impacted by that. And I look to be a financial advocate for citizens in this community to help, help create opportunities to better navigate our, our system for, so that folks can, can get the care that they need when they need it. Um, and I'd be committed to, to work with the board, the community, and OMC to preserve the existing services that we have here and hopefully grow and continue to expand when it's possible and financially feasible. And I look to improve, work with the board and, and OMC to improve this system of, of the overall health quality. Thank you. Well, I offer a diverse set of skills that I think would complement the existing OMC commissioners and be a valuable resource to any committee they would want me on. Of course, I'm committed to promote the best interests of the public. Overseeing the district, their, their business operations, and their community service operations. I would add here that I have extensive knowledge on the CMS cuts that were implemented. I did some analysis last September and handed them over to Eric Lewis, the CEO. And so if anybody wants to talk to me afterwards, I can tell you almost anything you want to know about these cuts and how they affect and will affect the hospital in the future. Well done, panel. Thank you, questioners. Those were good questions, and um, appreciate your involvement and participation. What we're going to do now is take a five minute break so we can set up for the Charter Commission candidates. It's my pleasure now to introduce Clallam County Deputy Prosecuting Attorney in the Civil Division who will inform us about the Charter Commission. She's going to tell us why it exists and what its mission is. Thank you. Before I get started, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters and Paula for extending the invitation to the Prosecutor's Office to come talk with you tonight and uh, share with you a little bit about the Charter Review Commission. So we're going to talk a little bit about what it is and what it does tonight. First of all, my name is Kimberly Ortloff, and so several of you don't have to spend several minutes wondering. Todd is my husband. <laughs> and I am a uh, Deputy Prosecutor with Clallam County Prosecutor's Office. I'm in the Civil Division. I wear many hats in the Civil Division. So primarily I run the Family Support Division, which deals with uh, child support issues. I represent the Department of Child Support for Washington State. I am the prosecutor's representative on the drug court team, so I am the gatekeeper for that program as well. And I work through the civil department on um, involuntary treatment holds, which is a relatively new function we've added in the last five years or so. Uh, we have two other civil attorneys who handle most of the civil work with the county. So um, their client is pretty much Clallam County. That is the only person, the only entity they represent. And Clallam County is what we call a municipal corporation under the law. So the municipal corporation that is Clallam County acts by and through its elected and appointed department and agency heads and through the county commissioners. Uh, so for example, what my colleagues do on a daily basis is they approve contracts as to form that different agency heads would like to sign. Uh, they review legislation that the county commissioners are considering. Uh, those are called ordinances. They also uh, bring lawsuits on behalf of the county. So if you have agencies who need to bring a lawsuit in order to get uh, properties cleaned up or debts collected, our office handles that. Uh, we also defend lawsuits where the county is named as a defendant. And it's under those duties that our department becomes the attorney for the Charter, Charter Review Commission of Clallam County. So going forward, I'm going to call the Charter Review Commission the CRC, just to shorten things up here. Um, in essence, the work of the CRC is similar 
to holding a constitutional convention, much like they had back in Philadelphia, back in 1787. Uh, but instead of writing a constitution, like the United States Constitution, uh, the Charter Review Commission, the CRC, works on what we call a home rule charter. And unlike the Constitution of the United States, where the uh, Founding Fathers were creating a whole new form of government, the CRC is limited by state and federal, uh, state and, uh, federal law as to what they can and cannot do. So the Clallam County's homeroom charter was first approved in 1976, shortly after I moved to Clallam County. Uh, the CRC is an opportunity for citizens, in this case 15 citizens at a time, to uh, propose amendments to this home, room, home rule charter. So of course the proposed amendments are also brought to the citizenry for a vote, for the, the commission does not itself make the changes. But they review the home rule charter and they propose amendments that are in the best interest of the county. So the homeroom charter rule specifically is authorized in the Washington State Constitution. You can find that at Article 11, Section 4 of the Constitution. Uh, this was allowed by an amendment to the state constitution that was approved by voters in 1948. So the home so rule charter uh, counties have been around for a while. We don't have a lot of them in the state of Washington. I think there are about seven now that are home rule charter. Um, when, the, when Clallam County became a home rule, rule charter county, we established where organic rules. Basically, that was the first approved draft of our home rule, rule charter. Um, and it amounts to basically a constitution for Clallam County. As such, those organic rules, those first rules, can only be changed by amendment to the charter. So the charter provides for the CRC in order to periodically take a look at our charter to make sure it's still serving uh, the purposes it was meant to serve and still fits well with our um, with our county and what, what needs to be happening. So like I said, I believe there are seven home rule uh, counties right now. Um, the rest of the counties still operate under the uh, rules for governing counties that, ca that were developed under the state constitution back in 1889. So for instance, Jefferson County is not a home rule charter county, so they still operate under those state laws rather than a charter that allows the citizenry of a county to take a look at what's going on and make those changes. Under our home rule charter, uh, some of the ch differences you will see, uh, currently the director of community development is elected in Clallam County, whereas the clerk of the Superior Court is appointed. This is very different from other counties who don't operate under home rule charter and haven't elected to do those sorts of things. Another example, and I think this is much more recent, um, our county commissioners are both nominated within their commissioner district and then voted on by the members, by the electorate in that district. They're not voted on by the entire county. That would be different from uh, counties that don't operate under this system. However, even in a home rule charter uh, county, there are certain uh, rules and offices that cannot be addressed by the CRC. Some of these offices include uh, the superior and district court judges, the prosecutor's office, and when applicable, the county school commissioner. And I believe this is because we want to keep those uh, functions consistent across counties in the entire state. So with that background, uh, next let's take a look at uh, what the Home Rule Charter states about our CRC. So I think we should be on slide four now. Okay. So to start with, there must be elections to fill 15 positions on the CRC uh, coming this November 2019 and then every five years thereafter. This time used to be a, an eight year span, but the CRC in one of the years has amended, put forth an amendment to the uh, Home Rule Charter that allows it to be every five years. There are five CRC members from each of our commissioner districts. Um, there are no filing fees to run for the CRC. 
at the general election, the top five vote getters in each of the commissioner districts will then be seated on the CRC. Out of those 15 members, the person who received the highest vote total overall will become automatically become the chairman of that CRC. Question. Yes. Uh, is that person not, with the most votes, the person that opens the meeting and then the election for chair occurs after that? I believe that is correct. The, uh, once the CRC is seated, uh, the, that particular CRC then develops their own procedural guidelines for how they're going to to uh, function as a as a board. Um, let's see. So the 15 people elected to the CRC do not receive a salary. Uh, they will be reimbursed for reasonable out-of-pocket expenses. The CRC also will receive from the county uh, reasonable funds, facilities, and services appropriate to an elected board in order to complete their mission. Um, so the 15 people who are elected to the CRC in this coming election will begin their process in January of 2020. And they will meet on a regular basis. Again, this will be established by uh, what procedures the CRC determines as appropriate I believe in the past, twice monthly has been a typical uh, meeting schedule. Uh, once they get there, they will agree to bylaws governing, governing their meetings in the process. Okay. So let's take a look at what the Home Rule Charter says about uh, the CRC and what it is intended for. Uh, we should be on slide five now. So the Home Rule Charter provides that the Commission shall review the Charter to determine the adequacy and suitability uh, to the needs of the community and may propose amendments. The Commission may also make recommendations to the County Commissioners and publish information and or findings. So again, this is the periodic review of our Charter to take a look at uh, what's going on in our community in all three Commissioner Districts what best serves our community, our community. And this uh, commission puts forth proposed amendments based on the needs that they see to make sure that our Home Rule Charter continues to address the community in an appropriate way. There are other tracks that amendments to the Home Rule Charter can take place. The county commissioners can also prepare uh, and approve their own amendment to the Home Rule Charter to be put on the ballot for voter consideration. Citizens can also propose amendments to the Home Rule Charter. Uh, to do this, they would need to provide a written petition of the amendment they are seeking. They would need to reg register it with the county auditor. And within 120 days of registering the petition, they would need to collect uh, signatures equal to 20% of those who voted in the county's previous gubernatorial elections. Uh, currently, that number would need to, uh, to exceed the 20% would be 7,893 valid signatures. Regardless of how a proposed amendment is uh, brought forth to the voters, uh, it must be given to the county auditor uh, by the first week in August. That's a hard and fast rule. The auditor needs time to prepare the ballots appropriately. Uh, get them out to the printer and get them back to get them out for the election. So if an amendment is proposed but does not make it to the auditor, it will not be put on the ballot. At that point, uh, all the proposed amendments go to the electorate and it's up to the citizens of Clallam County to determine what they want in that home rule, home rule charter. That is our Home Rule Charter, CRC, uh, in a nutshell. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer, yes. Um, when amendments are proposed to voters um, on the ballot for 2020, does yeah. it say like the CRC proposed this amendment and the Board of County Commissioners proposed this one, the public proposed this one? I, you know, that's a good question. And I'm not, I'm not absolutely certain. I know when I have written ballot uh, measures in the past for different agencies, it does indicate where it came from. So I would suppose that it would, but again, I could check on that for you. Uh, the Clown County homepage or uh, Clown County uh, website does have on its homepage um, a section on the Home Rule Charter, and you may be able to find some answers there as well. Yeah. Thank you.
Has someone been on the commission before that knows the answer to that ballot? Yes, Jack? The answer is yes. That it does designate who, what entity what put it on the ballot. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Well, All right. thank you very much for allowing me to come speak with you. All right, before we hear, and I think you can hear me, I will try hard. All right, can you pick this up? Ah, okay. Uh, before we hear from the candidates, I just want to note that all the candidates for Charter Commission were contacted through the emails that they submitted to the auditor's office. Eleven people filed for these five positions. One person withdraw, withdrew. All ten candidates responded they would attend tonight or they would send a representative. We have one uh, candidate who was, is traveling, so sent a representative on her behalf. So each candidate is going to have three minutes to present, and we're going to start, do it in the order that they filed, and we'll start with Jim Stoffer. And timers are here for those of you who don't recognize them. You'll see their signs. So, so watch them so you gauge your presentation. Jim. Thank you, Bertha, and the uh, League of Women Voters really appreciate this opportunity. I'm uh, Jim Stauffer. I originally from Napa, Idaho, and the Coast Guard uh, brought my family here in 2002. And then I later uh, retired as a Coast Guard uh, member. I currently serve on our SQUIM school board, and I've been a pretty active volunteer and advocate for our community. You'll see me uh, from driving our irrigation float to uh, working with, um, I'm also on the Chamber of Commerce Board, and so all that ties in together with the, the good work of our community. So as a current school board director, I would like to bring the needs of our students and schools to the Charter Review Commission, because it's very important to have that voice out there, and that is why I'm out there strongly advocating, because that might be an area where that message isn't always being met. I want to ensure that we foster a better understanding of the needs of our, of, uh, our students and schools throughout Clown County. And along with that, I serve on three uh, statewide committees. One of those is a, a State Board Association a legislative rep. And so I, I spend a lot of time um, having conversations with our legislators. I'm also on a statewide trust land advisory committee on behalf of WASDA and have uh, spent uh, a whole lot of time learning more about trees when I started forestry back when I was going to college. And through that work, uh, we recently were able to ensure uh, some state forest funding stayed here um, to support our schools. It was that a possibility of being taken back. And uh, through the partnership and collaboration with many other um, community organizations, we were able to keep that funds here. A uh, couple other things I serve on, just uh, working here in our community, and I would uh, bring my knowledge, ensuring the needs of our rural diverse community are on the forefront of all of us here. Thank you. All right, we'll turn to Ted Miller. Uh, uh, do we want to use that mic I just instead? Want to get close to the mic if you can, so everyone in the back of the room. Would that work? <coughs> All right. Okay. I'll give it a try and make sure that people can hear me. Okay. I also want to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum. Uh, my name is Ted Miller. I moved here in uh, 1997, retired from the Central Intelligence Agency and also from the practice of law. Um, the um, in uh, 2009, I was like, the microphone oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's easier to set back. In 2009, I was elected to the Swim City Council, and I'm on my 10th year there now. This is going to be my final term. In 2005, um, I'm sorry, 2015, I was elected to the Charter Review Commission, and I think I'm the only candidate here who was a former Charter Review Commission member. 
The main reason I ran again this year is I want to finish the work that we didn't quite finish in 2015. Uh, for background, almost everyone can appreciate the judicial positions, whether elected or appointed, should be nonpartisan. We want our judicial decisions to be impartial and not influenced by political considerations. In 2015, the Charter Review Commission wanted the, vo or wanted the voters to have the opportunity to complete the nonpartisanship of Clallam County judicial offices. Already, judges are nonpartisan. The Charter Review Commission several years ago made the sheriff's office nonpartisan. The only remaining one to do is, still the, is now is the prosecuting attorney. In 2015, Mark Nichols, myself, and the Charter Review Commission had a request of the um, Attorney General's office, is it legal for the Charter Review Commission to make the Attorney General, the uh, prosecuting attorney's job nonpartisan? We can't change the, uh, the functions or the powers, but we can change the uh, voting procedure. They decided that yes, it was. In fact, it was a very clear decision. And unfortunately, we ran out of time. By the time we got that decision, we no longer was able to get it on the ballot. So if I'm elected, I am going to try and make sure that that happens. Uh, obviously, the voters are, almost certainly, the voters are going to approve it overwhelmingly. They always love judicial officers being nonpartisan, so they don't have to worry about things. But uh, uh, it's just a matter of time. Uh, most of the other items I'm not going to have time to talk about, except that there are a number of other issues as well. And I hope to be able to work with the other four members of the uh, District 1 Charter Review uh, in order to affect them. And um, thank you very much. Donald Hatler. There. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm a little uh, new to the closer show. Yeah. How's that? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm a little new to this procedure. But uh, as I understand it, what you'd like to know is something about me. My name is Don Hatler. Uh, I was born and raised in the shadow of the Ozark Mountains, um, country, if you will. Uh, graduated from University of Missouri with a degree in chemistry and joined the Navy as, as an ensign. And of course, the Navy understood that and promptly utilized my chemistry degree to send me off to the Far East to run a, a division officer on a ship, which had nothing to do with chemistry. <laughs> okay, well, after that I wound up in Silicon Valley, um, and I spent 13 years there uh, in the process of building, managing, and uh, helping to design uh, analytical instrumentation for chemical research. Then I started a small business and ran a small business in the recreational area, built a marina, did some housing, and finally wound up here in Squim. And I was single at the time and found the love of my life uh, out in Happy Valley. That was 20 some odd years ago, and we're doing fine. <laughs> um, what have I done since then? Well, I've been treasurer with a Puget Sound Anglers for a number of years. I spent 12 years as uh, on the Board of Supervisors for the Conservation District, working with uh, piping irrigation uh, ditches, as you all know, and some of the other work that the Conservation District did. I retired from that and discovered that my wife wanted me to continue <laughs> and participate, so here I am. Um, <laughs> I guess it would be appropriate to say I really don't have an agenda. Uh, what I'm interested in is Tallinn County and the natural resources and the environment and the way the government interacts with that environment. So that's, uh, that's what I intend to do and if I'm chosen I will continue in that vein. Thank you. Tony Carrado. Hello. I also want to thank the League of Women Voters and all of you for coming out tonight. I'm a transplant to Squim. My wife and I moved here uh, just about 18 months ago from Colorado. <clears throat> so we're new. 
But I have to tell you, Colorado was beautiful. This is the prettiest place I've ever been, and I love it. In Colorado, I, I served, oh, I should tell you, I'm a mechanical engineer by profession, in the aerospace industry, retired, and so my background is primarily technical. Um, my experience in Colorado was interesting. I was appointed to the Color Elbert County, Colorado Water Conservation Board. I was made chairman of that board, served three years. And Elbert County is about a third the size of the entire Olympic Peninsula, and not a drop of flowing water was available. So we had to deal with some pretty severe issues, and that was an experience which took me deep into my technical background and made me learn to rely on the professionals and the agencies and the funding that was required to understand the issues. I also served for two and a half years on a voluntary commission for the county to develop an oil and gas regulation for Colorado, for our county. Uh, after two and a half years of dealing with it and looking at citizens' interests being protected because mineral rights were theirs in many cases, but the livability of oil development was a major concern. And so we adjudicated all that and only to have the state overrule us on almost every condition. And so that was another lesson learned. So why am I here tonight? Well, you know, the Chinese have a, a curse they like to put on people. They wish that you may live in interesting times. And I think these are extremely interesting times. They're not necessarily pleasant. And climate change is a major concern. And while the county has already recognized it and water is going to be a major issue, they've suggested we put a reservoir in, for instance. What bothers me is I've been through this once before. And if you don't have a plan in place, a master plan, you can't do an adequate job of preparing for emergency emergencies, period. And so what I would like to see us do as a county governance is simply put rigor and discipline into how we address these issues. What are we really going to do with land use, for instance, and development? What are we really going to do to protect our farmers, our farms, and our infrastructure? And I think I'm just about out of time. David, yeah, Lots Gazelle, let me hand the handheld mic. Oh, okay, David Lots Gazelle. You said that so well. Thank you. I practice. Good evening. Thanks for coming tonight. I am David Lots Gazelle. Can you sit down, sir? No, I've got something to show you. Oh. I am David Lots Gazelle. Born and raised here in our farmland in Dungeness. My wife, Therese, and I are very thankful that our two sons, Garrett, 31, Jake, 27, have chosen to start and raise their families here in our community. They are the sixth generation Lots Gazelles in Squim. We live in a unique area where you can walk in the Dungeness spit, enjoy the crashing waves, and within a short drive, in a hurricane ridge overlooking the splendor of the Olympic Mountains. We need to do all we can to protect our community. I'm a big private property rights supporter and realize there's individual circumstances. But there has to be a balance. We shouldn't have to suffer the eyesore of abandoned, dilapidated buildings, junk cars, and discarded items throughout our community, such as this abandoned house on your way down to Three Crabs Road, big rotted stuffed chair in the front porch, or this ugly salvage yard on the south side of Highway 101 between Squim and Port Angeles where every day valuable visitors to our community get to see this. And this is only a couple of examples. We can add language to the charter 
which would clarify the individual property's rights, the owner's responsibility to prevent and clean up messes and reclaim the integrity of our beautiful community. We can also add verbiage to ensure the responsibility of the enforcement of codes directed at these nuisances has a targeted plan which we can all review. This would ensure accountability and provide transparency. I was a charter review commissioner 15 years ago. I know how it works. I know how our system works. Vote for Lots Gazelle. Together we can clean up this mess and ensure our beautiful community survives for future generations. Thank you. Gary DeCourt. Good evening. I'm glad to be here. I'm very pleased to see the turnout tonight. I, I had anticipated a much more sparse turnout, but I'm very pleased to see. I noticed the numbers dwindled, but then I counted how many came up here to sit, so that, uh, that's good. <laughs> Most of the people in this room I don't know. I do know a few. My name is Gary DeCourt. I'm a candidate for the Charter Review Commission seeking to represent District 1. I'm married to my dear wife, Becky, for the last 36 years. We have four children. We have nine grandchildren. We moved to Blinn from Redmond, Oregon. On the 4th of July in 2012, we uh, drove the last U-Haul load over the hill, came down toward Jamestown about 10 p.m. and the fireworks were going off. So I thought that was a good move. It was a good thing we did. And my background, I have a bachelor's degree from University of New Mexico. I graduated in 1975. I'm also a veteran of the United States Navy. I enlisted in 1969. I'm a retired police officer. I've had a 30-year career in law enforcement. I've been promoted through the ranks, uh, joined as a patrol officer, promoted to corporal, sergeant, lieutenant, patrol captain, and uh, finally to administrative captain and deputy chief. I had the privilege of attending the FBI National Academy and graduated class 217. I've been past member of Rotary Club and Lions Club. I've served as a church elder in two different churches. Currently lead our church security team. My first priority my agenda, my first priority as your representative <coughs> is to foster inclusion by everybody, as many community members as possible, to be involved in the process of the Charter Review Commission so that we can have your citizen input. My second priority as your representative is to promote decisions of the Charter Review Commission that are made in the best interests of the citizens of Calhoun County. Thank you. Alex Fain. Hello. Uh, it all you know? is it, this is, yeah, yeah. Good. Thank you so much. Uh, some biographical data will, will uh, follow in my uh, minute following. I'd ask you to uh, visit with me to the year 2050, we're looking back. 30 years ago in 2020, little did we know that in the following decades, even more millions would be on their way north. On top of the evacuation of low-lying areas on the eastern seaboard, gulf, and west coast due to sea level rise, there was the influx from the ghost towns of Phoenix and Las Vegas from their thermal emergency and Colorado River failure. Never again would we underestimate our potential as a haven from the climate extremes that plague the rest of the country. There were a few key ideas from the CRC of 2020 that voters approved in the nick of time. Once we clarified the position of Director of Community Development, we were able to focus at last on long-term planning 
ending the era of commissioners pulling in different directions in an ad hoc reactive basis. Liaison with the four tribes sped tsunami evacuation during the great Cascadia uh, quake and tsunami of 2024, saving innumerable lives in the West End and waterfronts on the strait. Taking a clue from the Kualuit uh, tribal school moving to higher ground and coastal flooding during the king tides of the late teens, we discontinued building permits in area of tsunami or quake liquefaction danger. Similar to how SQUIM reinvented itself as lavender capital of North America, focusing on development as a tourist and retiree destination, even cleaning up its wastewater to boot, Port Angeles and 100 miles of bluffs and slopes along the strait rebuilt post-quake as green, as the green high-tech Riviera of the North. <laughs> Following the collapse of Alaskan fisheries from overfishing and mercury t contamination, uh, vertical aquaculture in cold deep waters of the strait, spearheaded by Squim's Marine Sciences Lab, is now the country's most productive ocean resource. Aquaponics by the tribe, supplemented by organic greenhouses of Squim, means we are now self-sufficient in food. When Olympia finally passed the state tax bill on mega corporations and billion trillionaires, we're ready with a plan to land those development tax dollars in our county. Never again would the big corps concentrate uh, concentrate official offices in vulnerable, unlivable Seattle. Post-quake, we got new satellite offices with zettabit fiber connected by PUD. Offshore to the North Shore became our new national marketed sl marketing slogan. Investments in solar, wind, and tidal power ensured we'd never again have a year without power, such as happened after the great quake. <laughs> Vicki <laughs> Bale will speak for Sue Erzin, who is out of town. Vicki. Thank you. Um, as the moderator said, my name is Mickey Vale, and Sue Erzin and I were elected to the Charter Review Committee in 2007. So, experience here. Sue asked me to read her opening statement, said she is out of town, and I'm honored to do so. These are Sue's words. I moved to Squim 19 years ago, and the year after we moved here was the election for a Charter Review Commission. I joined the League of Women Voters of Clallam County Charter Review Study Committee. Our committee attended the Charter Review Commission meetings, interviewed county officials, and researched information about the Charter. That experience helped me to understand the importance of our county charter and the charter review process in the operation of our county government. Later, I served as president of the League of Women Voters. In 2007, I was elected to the Charter Review Commission and served as vice chair. I was also on the Citizens Ad Hoc Committee for the SQUIM Comprehensive Plan and some years ago, I was vice chair of SQUIM Speaks. In the past, I have volunteered in the Master Gardeners Program at the Dungeness Wildlife Refuge and the Salvation Army Soup Kitchen. I also enjoyed golfing at Sunland, and I still hike with the Klahani Hiking Club. I'm asking you to vote for me because I have a broad knowledge of our community and an understanding and respect for our charter. As you know, this is a nonpartisan position. I will be impartial, fair, and I shall seek a wide input of ideas. If you elect me to the Charter Review Commission, I would revisit the issue of how often we meet. There are seven charter counties in Washington, and all of them except Clown County meets every 10 years. We now meet every five, but please know that while I have thoughts about this issue, I am a good listener. I would welcome citizen input. If you support me for this position and I am elected, be assured that I shall study the issues and make decisions for the good of all of our citizens. After all the candidates have shared their remarks, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions of the candidates. Obviously, I won't be available. 
I have given Mickey some calling cards with my email and phone number, and please feel free to contact me when I return in mid-July. Again, I am sorry to miss this forum. I hope you will vote for me, and thank you for your time. Sue Erzin. Candace Pratt. My grateful thanks to the League of Women Voters for organizing this forum. I welcome this valuable opportunity for the public to meet us. I moved to SQUIM in 97, and my background is pretty well uh, publicized. I'm currently serving the last year of my second term, and final term, as a city councilor of SQUIM. During these eight years, I have served as mayor and, and currently deputy mayor. I've been a liaison for the city to numerous boards and commissions that have informed me about the inner workings of the county. With six years on the board of directors of Clallam Transit System, one of those years as chair, I understand the importance of public transit as an economic benefit for our citizens by providing reliable and dependable service. Fewer cars on the road contribute to safer roads and improved air quality. I served four years on the County Homelessness Task Force with one year as chair. During that time, I learned about the dependence of local nonprofit organizations on federal, state, and local monies to fund their work as they cooperate to efficiently help the homeless and at risk among us. I served on the Countywide Planning Policies Review Committee during 2017 and 18. This was the first review in nearly 20 years. The committee had met for 17 months to bring the policies up to date, and the final draft was approved earlier by the councils of Squim, Forks, and Port Angeles, and the county commissioners. As you've heard, the Home Rule Charter is a governing document to serve the entire population of the county. This periodic review of the document is important to be certain it's truly serving the entire population of Clown County. I'm particularly interested in the case to be made for a finance department, the prosecuting attorney as a nonpartisan office, the autonomy of the director of, com of community development, and is voting for elected positions exclusively by district working for all? If you choose to vote for me, I will bring my experience and energy to the work of the commission. Thank you. Judith Parker. I'm Judith Parker. I've, <clears throat> I've been a resident of Squim uh, and Collin County since 2003. I've been an officer for my homeowners association and a member of the League of Women Voters for 20 years. In my professional life, <clears throat> I developed three distinct careers. I taught English literature at the university level. I subsequently became an administrator for UC Santa Barbara. Later, I was a criminal investigator for Santa Barbara County. Over these three careers, each covering about 15 years, I developed an appreciation for clear and concise policy and its correct application. In my judgment, there are some aspects of the chart which, charter which need to be reconsidered. For example, the lack of an at-large election of the three district, district commissioners, which I believe disenfranchises two-thirds of our citizens. And also the short five-year duration for the charter review cycle. Um, <clears throat> and finally, I want to mention an issue which has recently come up with the Director of Community Development. The voters of Clallam County have repeatedly voted for an elected DCD as opposed to an appointee because they want their DCD to exercise independence of judgment. They want their DCD to be capable of applying and interpreting building codes and land use guidelines without pressure from others within the county bureaucracy. However, the DCD's independence appears to have been abrogated in the case of the West Squim Bay B&B and Judy Lee, who want a single family residence permit for a huge structure. Here, the county commissioners abruptly decided to hire a consultant replacing the DCD with this permit decision. While I do not know the backstory, and some research must be done, I would like to explore ways of protecting the DCD's professional turf <clears throat> from the commissioner's obstruction. But I will be happy to listen to citizens about these concerns, because I really do listen. Thank you. 
All right, what we're going to do now is take a two minute break and what the candidates are going to do is position them up mm. and pos position themselves around the room for our speed candidate dating. <laughs> and so you can ask questions or you can leave them with questions which I know that they would all be happy to respond to you if you left your contact information, um, uh, like your email, that they could do that with your questions. So uh, do the best you can and uh, we will reconvene in 20 minutes. It looks like our candidates have just about taken their places. Um, and they're, we're going to start uh, closing remarks in the reverse order of filing. Uh, yeah, reverse order of fly, filing. Uh, it's very important to us that you complete the evaluation of this forum. It's kind of tricky to manage something that has 10 candidates. So we really want to get your input and someone stand, a league member standing at the door and we'll collect them from you. We're also asking the candidates to uh, evaluate it as well from your perspective as a candidate. And uh, Paula will collect those. Is everyone settled? Yeah? Yeah. Yes. Okay, and you'll notice there's one empty chair, and that is Mickey Vale, who did not have closing remarks, but she uh, did stay, and I think some of you were able to talk with her. Yes. Okay, good. All right, we're going to start with Judith Parker. One minute, you will be timed. Um, my, my, um, departure here is going to be short and sweet. <laughs> I'm very pleased to have met you tonight. Uh, I appreciated listening to you. I promise I will continue to listen to you. I think the Charter Review uh, will be for me an opportunity to serve the county in a way that works with my skills. Thank you. Candace Pratt. As City Councilor of Squim for nearly eight years, I have contributed to Squim's leadership, vitality, and vision. If elected, I will listen and carefully consider all petitions brought forward by the public. If elected, I will contribute the same leadership, vision, and enthusiasm that I'm known for. Please vote for me, Candace Pratt, and I thank you. Alex Spain. Hello. Uh, I met my uh, Washingtonian-born wife in Japan. Uh, she's a logger gal from Preston, right next to Issaquah. Uh, uh, we, we lived for uh, 20 years in Minnesota. We helped uh, care for her uh, aging parents. And so I've got a real heart for seeing that elder care. And also now that I'm one of retirees on uh, limited fixed income, uh, have uh, uh, access to all of their needs. Um, um, I, I'm the son of a UDT commander. My mother was a WASP and then in military intelligence, a WASP pilot. And she was a WASP sometimes <laughs> the other uh, during World War II. Uh, I'm, uh, I've worked in publishing, book binding, printing, everything from the bottom up, then computers, network administrator, put together bilingual computer systems, done everything. Looking forward to being part of a team. Gary DeCourt. Yes, I want to thank the League of Women Voters of Washington for establish, establishing this forum. Uh, I really, like everybody on the panel here, we appreciate the time and effort that was put into this by all the ladies and all the members. Uh, we thank you for that. We would, uh, I'd like to thank all the people that came out. You took time out of your day to be here, to uh, listen to everybody, and to make informed choices. That's very commendable. I'd like to say that my reason for running is to be of service to the community. I served in the military, I served in law enforcement. Uh, service is in my blood. Uh, 
if I can help, I want to be able to help so long as I'm able to help. And uh, my, pri my priorities are to uh, listen to you and your concerns and to act in best interests. David Lotz Gazelle. Well, this problem of messes in our county really became a passion of mine. And I spoke to the Green Drinks meeting they had in Port Angeles a little while ago. Driving past this mess every day, Visitors are very important to our community. Yes. They spend their money and then they leave. That's what we want. We don't want them seeing a mess like this. It just hurts my heart. Family's got a lot invested in this community. I have a lot invested personally, my wife and I and our children, next generation. When we talk about climate control or climate change, all these the, the worldly things, too much for me. But we can fix this locally, a mess like this. Just about everybody I talk to has got an abandoned car, abandoned RV, an abandoned dilapidated building in their backyard. We shouldn't have to do this. We shouldn't have to put up with it. And there's verbiage we can add to the charter to fix it. Tony Carrado. Is this on? Yes. Mm -hmm. oh. One of the things I learned tonight is the diversity and the breadth of change that fellow candidates are vying to accomplish, and I think that's great. And I think the ability to work together is going to evolve out of a group like this. But I want to say this, change is difficult for everybody. And unfortunately, change is also inevitable. And these times we live in, I may be too serious, but they are critical, and I want to see the health and safety and sustainability of this community preserved for many future generations. And that's all I want to say. Thank you. Donald Hadler. <coughs> Is this one better? No. Oh, sorry. There you go. Uh, yeah, uh, in the conversation, but I forgot to mention, I've been a member of the Dungeness River management team for the last 17 years, I think, as well as the 12 years on the conservation. Do you have a mic? Oh, a microphone. Oh. Yeah, get close to it. There, is that getting through? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Well, back to where we started. <laughs> All right, I've been a member of the Dungeness River Management Team for 17 years, as well as 12 years in the Conservation District. Um, why am I running? What am I? I'm running because I believe in the county. I believe in this, the city. I, I want to help. And the procedures are to review the charter, to determine its adequacy and suitability, the needs of the county, and propose amendment if it makes sense to do so. If you vote for me, that's what I'll do. Thank you. Ken Miller. Oh, okay, can everybody hear me? Yeah. All right. One of the roles of the Charter Review Commission, which isn't emphasized enough, is that we're the defenders of the Charter. Every time somebody proposes, everybody here is constantly proposing changes to the Charter. And many times, the voters have already made their decision on that. We're showing disrespect for the voters when we propose changes that they've already approved. And so my point is, unless there's a compelling change in circumstance, we should remember that the, the voters are the boss. And if, they're, if they voted a particular way, even if we don't personally like it, it's our duty to defend that decision. And I will do that when I'm on the Charter Review Commission. Jim Stoffer. When you look over the, the skills that are required for this position, it, it's uh, to have an ability to break down the key part of our charter and effectively translate this into our community needs. Uh, be able to efficiently research, review, and analyze information. Are effective at building community connections to ensure that the needs and desires of all of our community are appropriately reflected in our charter. And I, I believe I have a strong record of that community interaction in my service. 
and I would appreciate your vote and support. And I'm just going to give a shout out to the 5210 um, Healthy Leader Challenge that our Olympic Peninsula Healthy Community Coalition kicked off tonight. And uh, it's about uh, ensuring some healthy habits for all of our medical needs. And thank you again. All right, let's give a round. Thank you for participating uh, and being, uh, being uh, wanting to be part of the decision making for our community. We appreciate it. Uh, now before we close, are there candidates for other offices in the audience this evening who would like to introduce themselves? Yes, sir. Oh, someone else? Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, hi, my name's uh, Ian Nickel. I live in Port Angeles, and I'm running for a Charter Review Commission in District 2. All right. See you July 10th. Oh, okay. <laughs> who, 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 you, what? yes, sir? Uh, oh, not you. Okay. You're keeping it. Okay. <laughs> my name's Maury Modine. I live over in Beaver, and I'm running for um, the Port of Port Angeles in District 3. Um, for David, I came and stopped, and I'm going home. For Alex, I used to live in New Mexico. We got six inches of rain. We moved to Beaver. We get 140. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Maury Modine. About water, huh? Who else? Uh, Larry? Larry Jeffries. I'm running for <laughs> position District 1 school board here in Squim. Yay, sir? Uh, Bill Miano running for uh, Fire District 3 commissioner. Okay. For what? Fire, Fire District, District 3. 3. Oh. Fire, yes. Marilee Smith, and I'm also running for District 2 for the Charter Review. Okay. Who else? Uh, Jim? Jim Stoffer, I'm running for re-election for uh, Squim School Board uh, District 3, which is on the west side, or excuse me, east side, but everybody in Squim can vote for me, please. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Well, thank you as well. All right, thanks again too to Kim Ortlaw for her explanation of the Charter Commission. Uh, thanks to the lead members who helped put on this forum and to you, the audience that are left here. Thank you for your informed and informative questions and your interest in local, local elections. And if uh, candidates wanna stick around, uh, they're probably open to a few more questions. Ballots will be mailed on July 17th and they must be postmarked or dropped in the ballot drop box by August 6th. There is a box, ballot box at J.C. Penney Shopping Center and one on Mill Road next to Sunny Farms. Please remember to vote and thanks again for coming. <laughs>